It's time to start. Okay, let's uh, discuss this business of illuminating the MIL. What is the MIL? Malfunction indicator light. When ex emissions exceed the FTP standard by two and a half times. Mm. Is that right or is that wrong? The basis for illuminating the MIL is when emissions exceed the FTP standard by two and a half times. By one and one half times. One and a half times. Okay. So basically that's the standard that has been set. All right. All right. OBD2 continued the use of manufacturer-specific scan tools as the only way to access diagnostic information regarding emissions from vehicle computers. Mm -hmm. hmm? Can you get... Uh, well, this is what it says. OBD2 continued the use of the manufacturer-specific scan tools as the only way to access diagnostic information regarding emissions from vehicle computers. That is wrong on a bunch of counts. And the reason that is wrong on a bunch of counts is because ever since we've had um, trouble codes, we've been able to have aftermarket scan tools that would retrieve those trouble codes. As a matter of fact, um, Chrysler, all you had to do was turn the key on three times and it would flash the codes. On the Ford, if you grounded the self-test input terminal out there, the one that was by itself under the hood, watch the check engine light, or hooked up a test light to the self-test output between that and power, you could get codes that way. Um, so your manufacturer scan tool was never been, has never been the only way to get codes. Uh, the generic scan tool port that's underneath, the reason, there's a reason why that all of the uh, DLC connectors look the same. Uh, on these OBD2 cars because they wanted av average everyday American shops to be able to plug in a scan tool and get enough information to bring the emissions back to where they were supposed to be. See, they, act they didn't want the manufacturers making it where the only people that could work on it was the dealership. Mm -hmm. And um, then all the National Automotive Technician Task Force, you know, is all even, even putting information together so you can gather calibration information if you want to reflash one and stuff like this. Task Force or yeah, yeah NASDF. NASTF, yeah. and it's uh, basically the thing. Some of the stuff that I have written, uh, you know, just little commentary articles and stuff, have been published on that website because I know the guy that admins it's his name Bob. Well, how would you how would you say the name C H A B O T? How would you say that C H A B O T? That name. How would you pronounce it? Yeah. Well, I would say Cabot, but he says Chabot. Yeah, that's how he's how pronounced it. But anyway, that's his name, Bob Chabot. And he's a really nice guy. Matter of fact, I sat next to him at the Mac convention out there. And uh, he was uh, he was a sharp cookie, you know. But anyway, he's in charge of all that stuff. And he had contacted me one time and said, I've seen a couple of your uh, articles in Motor Age that are not technical articles, but they're just commentary articles on stuff. And he wanted to publish them in there, so I told him he could use them. Um, the misfire... Excuse me, the data link connector term, DLC must be a 16 terminal connector with some of the terminal uses being predetermined. Sure. That is true. Okay. Uh, on your 16 terminal data link connector, terminal, I want you to burn in and remember our terminals 16, which is hot all the time, it's usually a power of fuse. All right, which two are ground? Do you remember? 16 is hot, 4 and 5 are ground. Okay, remember that 4 and 5 are ground and 16 are hot. Now, if you happen to know which particular, you're going to, have to look in your book to find out on each of the vehicle you're working with, uh, you've got, you know, the different networks come to different terminals on there. But there are uh, standardized uh, places where the, you know, cavities where the uh, OBD2 information is supposed to come out. And I'll leave that to you guys to research that. But... Uh, as long as you understand that, if you plug your scan tool in and it won't power up, you know that whenever you pull it out, you ought to be able to hook and find ground at 4 and 5 and uh, power at 16. And that's going to tell you, usually if you don't find power at 16, you go check your signal ladder fuse and, <laughs> you know, that would be the reason for that. All right.
Now, the misfire monitor uses a principle involving crankshaft rotation in that all rotation of the crank will be uniform and consistent. Is that right? What can you tell me? Well, number four. This is a sort of a crazy question. <coughs> but you remember all the rotation of the crank is not going to be un I mean, uniformly consistent anyway. But no, it says it fluctuates. It's going to fluctuate. But if the, um, the computer is pretty dead gum smart, and it knows when you're accelerating, it knows when you're letting off, it knows when the engine's cold, it knows, it knows a lot of stuff. The more knowledge is power. The more, you, the more knowledge you give that computer, and the more outputs you give it, and the more you know, information gathering capability it has, the more it can do. So what they do is, do you remember what I told you guys, and we've talked about this before, and I just want to make sure that you remember it well enough to where you can intelligently discuss it. Um, the crankshaft has got to be learned, because no two are exactly the same, and there's product variability in the field and all that. So if you're uh, looking at your crank sensor, right, and you're looking at the waveform on the crank sensor, the computer has got to be able to look at the waveform on that crank sensor. Whenever a cylinder is misfiring, the engine slows down during that little part of the crankshaft rotation. Yeah. Remember that? It slows down a little bit. Because that, uh, you're getting a, every time you get an, a firing event in that cylinder, it's happening if it's working like it's supposed to on top of a piston, and that piston is going to drive the crankshaft. When the piston drives the crankshaft, then all of them are driving about the same, everything's normal. If one of them, because of a misfiring spark plug or uh, something like on my Jeep, if I parked my Jeep, I was telling them, uh, and, and let me ask you this, guys. Uh, give me a, give me an, give me, give me a, give you a scenario here on my Jeep charity. Um, some people, you know, may automatically just know what I'm talking about. We'll just see. But, uh, I talked to, I think I talked to you a little bit about it. You know, so, you know, just keep quiet, okay? Yes. No. Uh, I drive my Jeep. This is my symptom, y'all. I want you to listen to me. I drive my Jeep. I park it at Winn-Dixie. I go in there. I pick up uh, a Mrs. Smith's apple pie and a pint of ice cream, okay? What that's got to do with the Jeep? Nothing. But I did go in there to buy these things. I, and I've just driven it from hop. I mean, I stopped. Well, I went to Kentucky Fried. Then I went back there. But I, I went to the drive through at Kentucky Fried and I had a long time. Go back over to Windexy, switch it off, go in, come back out, crank it up, and it's been running smooth as silk. And now all of a sudden, after it's been hot silk, and it's misfiring. Bup, 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 bup. And I'm getting a blinking check engine light. Okay. I pull out my little scan tool that I keep in the console, little code reader scan tool that I bought for $60 from aetools.us, and I plug it in there, and I go, and I find out i got a misfire on cylinder number three. All right, so I switch off the Jeep, I clear the code, I crank it back up, it's still skipping. I say that. Excuse me, I didn't clear the code home. I drove the Jeep home, parked it out there on the curb, switched it off, switched the key back on because you can't have the engine running to clear the codes on that Jeep Cherokee. Cleared the code. All right, put the scan tool back in the console, let the Jeep sit there all night. This morning I crank it up, it's running smooth, and I drive it all the way to work, and it's not skipping at all. But from Win dixie parking lot all the way home, it skips, 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 skip on cylinder number three. It's very annoying. Can I give me an idea of what I'm dealing with there? Does it have a distributor or a coil pack? It's actually got a coil pack. It's got a big coil rail. It's got a coil rail that's got three coils on it, and it goes all the way from the front of the engine to the rear. Anybody got any idea? EPR. Well, if it's skipping particularly, the only time that can happen tip usually is if you're on a cylinder, I'm sorry, if you're on an engine that has those little EGR feed ports in each intake runner. Mm -hmm. And if all of those are stopped up but one, it will it, it will skip when you're accelerating and EGR is flowing, but it won't skip at idle. It wouldn't be a cool pack either. It would do it every time, plus it was a bad wire or something. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you remember what I told you guys? And I, we talked about this uh, last in the... Uh, I think you all need to be required to watch the, uh, the lecture videos about 16 times. But uh, we talked about this before. I mean, what would you do if you were going to troubleshoot that for me? This morning it's running just fine. It's kind of cool. well, it cooled off. Usually, yeah. You can't find the problem to us doing it. Exactly. So. But how did I get it to do it? Think about what I did. You want to do? You want to go to similar conditions? 
what I did was the engine got really warm. You got to drive it for a while. Get it good and hot. You got to get it good and hot, and then you're going to switch it off, and you're going to let. That's called a hot soak. When you switch it off, and for a little while after you switch the car off, it actually gets warmer before it cools down. All right, so it heats up a little bit, and so whatever it, whatever is going on has happened during a hot soak. Now there's two things that could cause it. It didn't start hard. It fired right up, but it was skipping on one cylinder. And it stayed skipping on one cylinder until I got home. Now, sometimes when, it, when vehicles are exhibiting this kind of concern, they'll skip for about 30 seconds, and then they'll clean up their act, and then they run just fine the rest of the time. Did it be carbon build up? Well, no, because this morning, I mean, a while ago, I changed the oil in it earlier, I mean, while the high school students were here, and I took the radiator cap off, and I noticed that I had to add about a quart of water to the radiator. You think that might have something to do with it? Okay, this is how you play out. Uh, my contention is, and I'm postulating right now because I haven't really done any serious troubleshooting. My, my, come on in here and I'll send you a ticket there, buddy. My, uh, my postulation here is that I've got cooling getting in a cylinder, but there's not a lot of it. All right, I'll hold this sign. I'm going to put the blame in the sun. <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Put it, on, put it on the desk and everything. Okay. All right. But uh, anyway, so this is what you do. Listen to what I'm telling you because you're probably going to be faced with this sooner or later in a situation similar to it. If you got one that skips a little bit and then it cleans up its act, you got to switch it off while it's still skipping. And you got to pull the spark plugs out. Remember what hole you got them out of. And the one that you see steam coming off of, or if you see it dripping wet with gas, or if you see anything different about that one spark plug, it's going to give you a clue as to what's going on. If I see steam boiling off of it, I know I'm getting coolant in that cylinder. Now, the one that Amanda spun over the other day, and it geysered out of there and wet me all over my britches, was pushing compression into the water, right? That is a different kind of a blown head gasket. The blown head gasket I got on the Jeep, or the packed head if that's what I got, is allowing coolant to migrate into the combustion chamber, but there's not a, the leak is not so that it can push it into the water. It doesn't cause it to overheat. It causes it to skip after a hot soak. And then the, the, the other clue is the next morning, it does just fine, you see. But it's always after a hot soak. If it was a dripping fuel injector, it will usually start hard. In other words, if I got a fuel injector dripping, it's going to put all kinds of, uh, of fuel vapor to wafting around in the uh, intake. And as soon as I start it, all that fuel vapor is going to condense and go in there and wet the spark plugs. And then I'm going to I'm going to be going, uh, I'm going to be spinning it for 45 seconds, and then finally it's going to start and putter and pop and cut up and finally clean up its act, and it's going to be okay. It won't keep skipping on that one cylinder. Unless it's got a serious leak, but it runs so good the rest of the time. And, I'm, and the fuel trims even look good on it. You see what I'm saying? Because I've looked at all that. So that's how you troubleshoot something like that. You understand? Now, I don't want you guys that are finishing up. There's three people sitting at this table right here that are finishing up. All your three of your names on the graduation list. I don't want you going to uh, somewhere and not having a clue even what to do. Of course, usually you're going to look and pull your scan tool numbers and see what kind of uh, you know, misfire goes you got. Okay, now, the misfire monitor on my Jeep noticed that number three was not, it was, the crankshaft was slowing down every time number three was firing. Well, that's what the misfire monitor is about. Okay, can somebody tell me why it is, I mean, how it is? Nothing like some lukewarm coffee. But uh, somebody can tell me how it is that the crankshaft knows what's normal. Remember that? Chrysler and Jeep calls this figure that it uses, this snapshot it takes of a normal crank, the adaptive numerator. You got crank learn on some GMs. This stuff, like I said, how do they do it? You remember how they do it? You got to keep burning this PCM in because you all aren't remembering it, huh? PCM does that, right? It does. How does it do it? If you were going, if you were an engineer and you said, "I need to know what's normal for this crankshaft. I need a snapshot of what's the way it's supposed to be, as far as the spa the spacing right. between." Right. Take a picture of it when it's doing 
Exactly. When you let off. Yeah. And you let off and it has shut the fuel injectors down. Mm -hmm. And there's no fuel going in there, but you're basically using the engine for braking. That's when it gets that information. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. That's how it does that. And it's also got the, like I say, it, the factors in the rough roads and all this kind of thing. We talked about that before. Okay. Now then, the crank sensor, actually four is false. The crank sensor is number five. The crank sensor relearn must take place immediately after you're done replacing a crank sensor. What in the world is that about? I was saying, when you take your crank sensor off, you, you got to relearn a new pattern or something? Well, the crank sensor, when you mount it, may be in a slightly different spot, if depending on how it's mounted. But, you know, it's basically, there's going to be some little idiosyncrasies that change whenever you change that sensor out. Mm -hmm. And the, the book, the, the textbook and the, the answer key that the guy, the, whoever wrote this book put together, uh, they, won't say, they want you to put a true answer there. Typically, if you change a whole lot of stuff, or if you empty the, or if you dump the, a memory by taking the battery cable off, it's got to relearn anyway, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff it has to relearn. It's got to... Uh, how many of you have ever changed out a battery on a car and then found out if you changed the battery out, it wouldn't idle? I don't know about that. You'll see that on a Dodge. Oh, yeah? Yeah, Greg may run into it on his. And uh, what I always like to do if I'm changing the battery out on one of those, if you do that... On any Dodge? Uh, it can happen on a lot of different cars, but the Dodge seems to be worse than any of the rest of them. But if you pull the battery out, you put it back in, you fire it up, and see, and let's say that somebody hadn't done any work on it in a long time, and all of a sudden the battery just goes down. Mm -hmm. You know, so they pull the battery down, I mean, they pull the battery out, pop another one in there, and they crank it up, it goes dead, crank it up, it goes dead, crank it up, it goes dead, it won't idle. And it has learned to give it more idle air than it really would need because the throttle body is kind of stopped up. Okay, so since it has forgotten all that information, it's gone back to the default, what it was when it was a new car. Now it's trying to operate like it's got a clean throttle body, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So you want to wash the throttle body out really good. Oh, okay. You know, use your plastic toothbrush and clean all that stuff up. You know, some of these throttle bodies nowadays have got, supposedly got a coating on them. It's supposed to keep them from sticking and all that kind of stuff. Well, they still clog up with that crud, and they claim you're not supposed to clean them. You know, but I've seen those things get dirty too. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you'll see a hole in the throttle plate. Did you ever see that? Uh, huh? Weird. You know why they do that. Think about it now. Why would they put a hole in the throttle plate? Where's the clogging usually going to take place? Around the edges of the throttle plate. So instead of having the throttle plate let air go around the edges of it for your idle speed, they let it go through that hole. That make sense now? It actually does. Think about it. Really? No. Now don't go and get a drill and drill a hole in your throttle plate, okay? It's not a good plan to do that. All right. You don't want to change anything. We don't want to change nothing like that. The crank sensor, let's see, I'm sorry. In OBD2, emission components like the EGR, AIR, and PCV. Okay, somebody tell me what EGR stands for. Exhaust gas recirculation. Okay, AIR? Uh, I don't That's tough, isn't it? I don't remember that. <laughs> they're, what they're talking about there is the, is the GM name for that air injection reactor. That's what that is. What about PCV? Positive crank. Is it crankshaft or crank case? Crank ventilation. case ventilation. There's no reason to ventilate the crankshaft because it doesn't breathe. All right, so crank case or crank case ventilation. Okay, OBD2, okay, emission components like EGR, AIR, and PCV. Okay, here's the next question. We're going to take this, we're going to take this to the next level. Uh, that is question number six. Got it? Is that question number six? Mm-hmm. All right, OBD2, EGR. Does it monitor the EGR? Does OBD2, see OBD2 is different from OBD1 in the fact that OBD1 uh, had a continuous monitor function and could store codes in memory and all that. But OBD1 had no earthly idea. Uh, by default, it didn't. I mean, it didn't have to have. It didn't have to know if the EGR was flowing. It didn't have to know if the... Um, air injection reactor system was working. Now, when you did a key on engine running self-test on a Ford, it would check that stuff. But driving down the road, it wasn't paying a lot of attention. That didn't have to. It wasn't required to by law. But it could tell you if there was a problem, and it would throw you a code so you could figure out exactly, you know, get a starting point of where to go to fix it. So is the PC monitored? Um, no. 
Do you even know of a system where the PCV is monitored? Have we even talked about a PCV monitor? I mean, is, do we have that? What are you seeing in your book? Amanda's digging hard there. It never says anything about a PCV. Now, air injection reactor, that it will, it does monitor that. It's going to monitor that system. Secondary air. So, Ben, where's your book? Yeah, you got it. I stole it from you. Okay. I got it there's your one. I came here right. Because you went here all the time, so I used it. So you dragged around. No, I did not. So I would say that one there, because of the fact that you're not going to pay a lot of attention to PCV in most of them systems, I'm going to put a false on there because that's what the... That's what the book writer wants, is a fault on number six. Okay, you got that? It's possible for a vehicle to fail the diagnostic test more than once in order to illuminate the mill or record a DTC. Isn't that right? It's possible for the vehicle to have to fail it more than once. This is OBD2 now, on OBD2. Have you ever? How many of you have ever gone into your scan tool and looked and saw this little thing that says pending trouble codes? Mm -hmm. no, that means it hasn't pending. turned on the light, but if I see this trouble code happen again, I'm going to turn the light on. See, they don't want the check engine light popping on all the time. I had heard people, you remember, when, you know when General Motors put a check engine light that was emission related on their cars? Just about every GM car had one in 1981. And the people that drove those cars and the ones in the 80s after that said the, the, the one thing that always works perfectly on this, light, on this uh, GM car that I have is the check engine light. It always comes on. Never fails to come on. But, I mean, you could take the air cleaner off or leave the air cleaner nut loose on a GM car that had a feedback carburetor and the dadgum check engine light would come on. Those things were a pain in the rear. Now, if you understood them real good, you could just keep it. You know, they were meant to keep everything good, you know. But Ford stayed away from check engine lights until 1988. Chrysler called theirs a power loss light. If you had came on and said power loss, that typically alarms people. They don't want any power loss, so they're going to rush and hurry. You know. All right. So, but it is possible for a vehicle to fail a diagnostic test more than once, unless it is something that's really serious and it's not going to wait until it turns that one on. Like for instance, on my Jeep. It wasn't misfiring at all until I cranked it up after Win Dixie, and then it immediately started flashing that light, and it threw me a code because it could damage the catalytic converter misfiring like that. Those kind of the really serious type A and type B, you remember? How can it damage your catalytic converter? Because of gas going down there and he overheating. The catalytic converter runs about 2,000 degrees, mm -hmm. and if you load it up with gas and it gets hotter than it's supposed to, it can melt that sucker down. It's ruining it. That's what you're worried about, that. And uh, it's and very expensive. The first digit of the B1058 signifies, that's a code, code B1058, signifies that it is a generic code number that manufacturers will use for the same component and fault problem. False. That's false. What does the first digit mean? It means if it's manufacturer specific. I mean, what, if, if you were, if you were pulled a, if you did a full code scan and you saw a B1058 code, but you would know that that was part of which system? What does B stand for? Body. Body, and then you got C codes, U codes, P codes, this kind of thing. U codes are network, C codes are chassis, which would be like what systems? Chassis. Chassis would be like home. No. Well, like a sway bar. Well, chassis, uh, sway bar is not going to give you a trouble code. What about your steering arm? Uh, steering arm is part of your chassis, but it ain't going to give you a trouble code. What about anti lock brake, y'all? Yeah. Any lock brakes? Any what about uh, what about variable assist power steering? What about any of this vehicle dynamic stuff? What about your suspension system? You know your dynamic suspension. Wouldn't that be a? Yeah, there you go. You ever seen that commercial on that? The, they had come out years ago with these where they did this Lincoln Mark Eight or whatever it was, and they would drive it up to this concrete barrier that was you know had space under it, and they drive it up and it would. This concrete barrier is like that, and the car would go dink, and it would touch a concrete barrier. You know, you'd see, the, see it touch. And then the guy would go down to the other end of the test track, and he would come back 70 miles an hour toward that concrete barrier yes. and go under it. Oh, and go under it. The reason he went under it was because when you hit like 60 miles an hour, the car would lower oh, okay. to make it more road worthy. <laughs> yeah. That was so cool because you expect he's going to rip the whole top off the car because you saw it touch, you know. That's pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, test, test drivers, test drivers do that kind of thing. You wearing a bell helmet on your head. You do a good job. If it didn't work quite right, you know, they'd know some. Yes. All right. I'm not. If I was him, I would be sitting really low in the seat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that first digit of the B ten fifty eight doesn't mean anything except body. It doesn't mean what they said. So that's a false one too. The trouble code system will usually. Now wait a minute. The first digit would is the first digit. A B or is the first digit a one? One. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't matter. It still doesn't mean that. It's not a generic code. Well, if it was a generic code, what would the first digit be if it, in the, as far as zero. the number? Huh? Zero. A zero. Yeah, you got that. Trouble code system will usually use the last two digits to indicate the specific fault, but may use all four digits if necessary. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, now let me tell you a little something. Sometimes... You may have these vehicles, like some of your Chryslers, when you switch a key on the power loss light will give you flash the codes out. Like it may flash you a 17 or it may flash you a 33 or something like that. The last code it flashes to tell you it's done is a 55. Well, let's say it flashes you a particular two-digit code. And what you'll get here is, and I don't have these codes memorized, but let's say it gives you a 33. That just tells you that it's in the general area of your oxygen sensor or something. You see, I mean, that may not be exactly what that code means, but let's just say that's what it did mean. Whenever you plug your scan tool in and you pull your, your P codes, you're going to see a whole a bunch of different P codes out here that fall under that purview. And this right here is going to point you in the direction, in this general direction that all of these codes are talking about. The P code is going to tell you specifically which oxygen sensor is giving trouble or which place you need to look. See, this is just saying you got problems with your air fuel mixture or whatever. This right here says the oxygen sensor on the front of the left bank has got a lean condition. So the, these codes are a lot more fine-tuned than these old two-digit codes that are by themselves uh, most of the time. Have, have you, some of you may have seen where you've got a, when you switch on a Jeep Cher, uh, Grand Cherokee sometimes, like in the you know late '90s, early '00s, you're going to get a uh, a uh, turn on the key three times. You'll actually get that P code on the odometer. It'll flash the on the. No, it's got a, it reads it out on the instrument cluster odometer. It'll say P1058 or whatever the code is. And I've seen those before. If you, I mean, it gives the customer that if they want to see it. You know. All right. Yeah. Readiness indicator monitors. Yeah, y'all don't pass out free answers to these guys because they had not heard me talk. All right. The readiness indicator monitors only indicate that particular tests have been run, but they still need to be reviewed by a technician to ensure they did not fail. That is number 10. There is a device that you can buy, and I don't have one, but there's a device that you can buy that you can plug into the data link connector and you can drive that car uh, and like what I would ordinarily do is I'd go out here to the bypass, I would drive down there, I'd go through a couple of these traffic signals, I'd hit, you know, road speed, you know, 60 miles an hour, I'd stop at the traffic signal, I'd sit there and idle for a little bit, I would go into the next traffic signal, I'd sit there and idle, I may turn right at that traffic signal, I'd come through town, I'd stop at all the red lights, I'd come back, you'll come to a point in a minute where it goes beep and it tells you that everything is cleared, your P1000 code's gone, all the monitors are passed. That's important when you're doing that. That's Glenn. Papa G. He owns a pizza place. Gail. Um, fiddle faddle. I'm not exactly. What was it? Oxygen. Oxygen sensor. Nothing else has a heater, does it? Is there a heater on the barometric sensor? No. no. Did you know the barometric pressure sensor is built into the PCM on some vehicles? And on some of them, it's built in there behind the instrument cluster. It's really weird when they put so those things. Heat the PCM all up and get that nice and warm. Oh. That'll it'll. Yeah, baby. All right. This one guy had to have his PCM replaced because he's uh, he accidentally lit off a round on his pistol and shot a hole in it. <laughs> an OBD two. An OBD two code starts with the letter P. The function of the device that generated the code is powertrain. Not chassis, not body, it's not network or data link. An OBD, oh, here's another thing. You know what the uh, the stuff that's covered under warranty, under the OBD2 uh, thing, is a catalytic converter, P1000, 
PCM, data link connector, check engine light. Check engine lights covered for a long time. If it was working, they'll fix it for free up to like 80,000 miles. <laughs> I think they're required to do that. But, I mean, if you got your big dollar items, like your catalytic converter, your PCM are covered. Like 30,000 miles? No, at 80. Oh, they're 80? Yeah, on that, unless they've changed that. But it, it was 80,000 miles forever. All right. Unless I'm out of the loop and somebody, something's happened I don't know about. I would just break it at like 79,000 just so they could fix it for me. Yeah. yeah. They you another 80,000. Yeah, there you go. Oh, no, you don't get another 80000 no. Basically, if they can tell you broke it, then you're buying it. All right. And OBD, they don't they don't guarantee it against having a you know a whole job in it with a stick or something, right? You know what I'm saying? I'd probably water up in there. Yeah. Well, they see, that, uh, they see that water has been thrown in there, and then you still got to pay for it. Right. An OBD2 code starts with the letter P. With the letter U. We got that. We got that already. OBD2 code starts with the letter U. Network. That's network, isn't it? Which of the following OBD2 monitors involves many various engine sensors? And this car monitor. What? Because it would be, uh, it'd be, no, if you're a comprehensive component monitor. Yeah, the, what is, a, somebody tell me about your comprehensive component monitor. Can you imagine all, all the sensors that work? Hmm. Now we're just making sure, well, to begin with, whenever we first uh, turn on our key, we're going to open our eyes and we're going to look at throttle position, engine coolant, intake air temperature sensor, barometric pressure. You know, there's a lot of stuff we're going to be looking at. While we're driving down the road, we're going to be noticing all these sensors and we're going to see if they stay in the range that we expect them to stay in. You got that? they got to stay in the range they're expected to stay in. If they dip out of that range or if sometimes they'll have a... If I was going to do a rationality check and I was watching my mass airflow sensor... And I was operating my, like if I'm the PCM, and I say, I think I'm going to idle us up a little bit. If I idle us up a little bit, or let's say that I noticed that the uh, person that is driving the car has operated the throttle, but I don't see the amount of air coming into the engine change, then I know there's something not telling me the truth, don't I? If I see the throttle position sensor voltage up, but the mass airflow voltage stays flat, I'm the PCM, I'm going to throw a, it's a rationality fault. This should, and if whenever I rev up, you know, I showed you all this before, but if I've got throttle position, if, they, if things are working the way they're supposed to, then throttle position and mass airflow should do this. Pretty much. Uh-huh. I do. And that's what you know. You get used to looking at that. I was telling Amanda that yesterday. We were looking at, uh, uh, I got. I was going to pull up these old uh, waveforms and show you guys from that Grand. I mean that PT Cruiser. I figured out what was going on with that, but I had to. I had to see a normal waveform before I would be able to figure it out. Because nobody on earth is sharp enough to look at a waveform of cam and crank sensors on just any car you throw at them and tell you it's right. You just can't do it. You cannot do it. I don't care who you are, how smart you are. Now, if you've seen a bunch of these kind of cars and you know what it's supposed to look at, you got a piece of information you can. You know, frame of reference in your mind. On this one here, I was seeing waveforms. I had a, I had waveforms, but you know, what am I looking at? What's going on with it? Cam timing. Uh, the the cam camshaft is moving in relation to the gear a little bit good. back and forth. And whenever it moves a little bit, it'll sputter and pop and cut up. And it was the these waveforms when I compared them to what they were supposed to look like. With information I got from Identifix because they had the little Chrysler waveform thing that came from the school on that. And I didn't have that. When I got that, I said, This is as plain as the face on your nose. What's wrong with this car? The cam and the crank are out of time. Just a little bit. Not much. Like it runs. And they move, which means when they move back like they're supposed to be, it runs great. And without warning, they'll shift a little bit and they'll pop, 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 pop. You know, it'll start doing all kind of crazy stuff. My buddy's Mustang, he's yeah. got 351 and stomps on it. Mm -hmm. And his, he didn't know his little big uh, distributor. Hold down thing mm -hmm. was a little loose. Mm -hmm. He'd mash on the distributor blah, and turn and mm -hmm. yep. he let off of it. Anything that changes like that. <laughs> anyway, what about her? Like tell me about an EGR monitor. If I'm going to monitor my EGR system, now you're engineering this thing, I need to know if my EGR is working or not. So what am I going to look at? The I've got, I'm going to program the PCM now. I'm programming the PCM. I'm in control of how this PCM thinks. And I need you to tell me what I need to do to determine. I'm telling it to give. I'm telling it that I want EGR. Now I need to know if I'm getting EGR. What is something I can look at that will tell me if I have EGR? Uh, 
I need a step. I need a feedback loop. The valve opening. I need to know if that. Well, that's not going to tell you if it's your fluid. Okay. Well, the one valve. If the valve opening, that could that could do something. Two. Mm -hmm. If the other side of the valve is getting flow, like you can heat. Yeah, kind of like heat. And the, and the mass airflow can tell you what's coming through it. Can't you feel the pipe to see if it's flowing? That's a good point. And JT kind of touched on that. Okay, now then, this passage right here, that we're, actually I didn't draw that quite right. This passage right here when that EGR valve is open is going in here, and here's the throttle plate, and air's coming in that way, right? So I've got my throttle plate open. I've got air coming in. EGR's coming in there. You notice this can always typically, usually, not every time, but usually it's going to be coming in right behind the throttle plate. All right. So... One of the things that you talked about was seeing if the pipe is hot. All right. What, what the uh, Asian automakers like to do, and I'm trying to get away from saying Japanese because Asian is Japanese to me, of course, you know. <laughs> they put a temperature sensor right here. EGR temperature. If their EGR is flowing, you'll have some temperature increase. They're usually the only ones that use that. All right. How does this one know? This engine on the stand over here is a Ford. Nice airflow. All right. You got some. It doesn't look at mass airflow. It's got a pinched little orifice in here that I'm trying to fix. Okay. All right. And it draws information <coughs> from both sides of that orifice, and it's got a sensor here that's reading both of those. And that sensor's got three wires going to it. All right. Whenever you've got flow here, what is the pressure going into this one going to do? It's going to be low, it's going to be higher. Exactly. It's going to, the pressure on this side is going to go up, the pressure on this side is going to go down. And it knows, you know, that one there is like that, see like that uh, cast aluminum sensor has got about six tenths of a volt at rest. And then whenever you start to get more EGR, it goes up to like 4.6 if it goes wide open EGR. But, what if uh, you can also measure, like you were originally Ford used to do, was they would put a sensor on top of the EGR, we have the Broncos like that, and it's got the linear potentiometer. Yeah. And when that EGR started to open, that potentiometer voltage would go from four tenths to whatever. All right, and so it would know that it was moving, but that wasn't good enough because if the. It could be clogged or something. It gets clogged right here with sludge and crud and all that kind of stuff. So if you're clogged with sludge and crud, that's where the rubber meets the road. We're going to know. There's two ways we can check this. Also, we're going to come off of this uh, manifold with a sensor, all right, when I'm starting to get EGR, I've raised this off of this seat, this is my EGR valve right here, and I'm, let's say that I don't have carbon and crud in here, uh, I'm supposed to see what right here if EGR is flowing? Exhaust gas. No. I'm not looking for exhaust gas with my manifold absolute the pressure should increase. The pressure should increase, which means your vacuum is going to drop when EGR starts to flow. How's a how does the car tell how much vacuum it has? Like, it's in all the lines and stuff, but it's also in the intake. There's no vacuum sensor. The map, map sensor would tell the pressure is inside, like, the pipe. It does both of those. It can tell the vacuum? Yeah. Because it, 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 it reads all of that. You know this gauge that we got out here that we hook on? It's got a needle that goes both ways. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Now, the only time you ever have positive pressure in, the, in here is when? Boost. If you got boost, you know, so your map's got to read that on those. So that's why you got a special one. Yeah. You yeah, also yeah. got, but the fact is, it's reading. It's going to read air, everything from atmospheric pressure on a regular natural aspirated car all the way down to you know the so lowest zero, engine vacuum. Zero vacuum to perfect vacuum. Yeah. So you got you're going yeah more or less, but you don't have a perfect vacuum yeah. in here. You're pulling the the piston is you know atmospheric pressure. It's actually creating low pressure to pull atmosphere in. This throttle plate is what it's pulling against, and that's what gives you your vacuum, right? But the point is, I'm trying to make, whenever the EGR is flowing, this pressure is going to drop. What's going to happen at oxygen sensors? They're going to detect that there's more, uh, there's more or less air. So you're, they're actually, the voltage is going to drift up yeah. when you start doing EGR because you've got less burnable oxygen, right? So you're actually going to see that. So there's a bunch of different ways. GM did that. What GM would look for is they would look for oxygen, oxygen. sensors to reflect a slightly richer condition, and that's how they could tell if it was flowing. They were doing that before OBD2, it's a rationality thing. 
So you can look at, like Ford does, you can do this. The Japs, you can do the, uh, or the Asians, you can do the temperature sensor here. Uh, General Motors now, even though they've got mass airflow, they typically got a mass sensor too. So they want to look, they want to monitor manifold absolute pressure for EGR purposes and whatnot. So there's a whole ton of stuff. They can also use MAP in a situation where mass airflow, uh, if it totally fails or is unplugged or something like that. If it's an in range failure, you got issues, which is why well, we've already been there. The ones of us that did the Pontiac Aztec, by the way, that Motor Age article came out in this month's Motor Age. Um, all right, so OBD2 monitors are usually run during when? Idle, acceleration, cruising, or all the above? All the above. All right. Oh, by the way, I wanted to ask you this question too. Your air injection reactor monitor, how are you going to know it's working? Huh? Air injection reactor. How are you going to know it's working? Hey, book, I can see that deer in the headlights look over there. Guys, I'm going to program my own PCM and I need to know how the, uh, I need to be able to tell my air injection reactor system's working. That's how I think about this stuff. If I was an engineer, how would I do that? You got that? What you going to do? I'm going to dump the air upstream. And then I'm going to see if the oxygen sensors reflect that. That ain't complicated, is it? What about my, how many of you have seen, seen a car with a gas cap light? A it's got a little picture of a gas cap. That's that truck that was here. <laughs> no, I'm talking about a light that looked like a gas cap that's oh, not yeah. been put back on. You ever seen that? It's, or they'll have a words that'll say fuel cap. Yeah, my sister's 2,500 cord has it. How does it know? How does it know the gas cap's off? It's got a gas yeah. cap sensor? No. The pressure in the gas tank? No. Honestly, well, know. sort of. I've seen the light. Why well, have you heard? Have you, seen the light. Did you, did you <laughs> feel the heat? <laughs> okay. She uh, didn't have it all the way tightened, and it said gas, or uh, I think hers says fuel cap. Okay, now, why did it choose to turn on a fuel cap light instead of a check engine light for an evaporative code? It's smart. It knows you just filled the car up. Oh, it's looking in its memory and it says, wait a minute, they switched off the key, they switched on the key, now I'm running full of gas, and now I'm not holding pressure back there. <clears throat> Turn on the light, they flip the, the computer flips its little digital toggle switch and the light pops on. Yeah, it's on top of your car. That guy, that little computer gas in there. It's hanging by its little up. tether, you know, and all that. And, uh, but anyway, I, I guess when I was driving that diesel rabbit, I, I, lost, I lost four or five gas caps because I'd forget to put them back on. Did you ever, uh, did you ever leave a, uh, the gas thing in the gas? <laughs> no, I never have, have done. Never have done, done that. <laughs> you did? If I if I had if I had done that, I wouldn't do it. That's hey, you can't yeah. believe it. we got to pay for my gas <laughs> money. We got like ten police cars behind me. <laughs> OBD2 systems must illuminate the MIL if the vehicle emissions exceed the allowable standard for that model year based on a what? Federal scale. Federal test procedure is what FTP stands for, by the way. Uh, isn't that interesting that uh, in the computer world, file transfer protocol is FTP, and in here it's federal test procedure. Now, somehow we've only got so many letters, and so they stuff them all in this stuff. All right, now then. Federal what? Federal FTP. test procedure. OBD2 requires monitoring emission-related components for both functionality and? That's what I was talking about earlier. They know that some ought to, some sensors ought to respond. The AIR system does that too. You know, if it dumps the air upstream and it looks for the oxygen sensor to go lean, it knows that it did that. You know, if it looks, if it's getting what it's expecting, the catalyst monitor detects this catalyst's ability to store and give off oxygen through the use of a what? Post catalyst oxygen sensor. Post catalyst oxygen sensor. Give that girl a cigar. All right. Now, right here we got. The blank detects malfunctions that can result in fuel system rich or lean conditions. This is done continuously and involves the long term fuel limits. Uh, That's a fuel system monitor. Yeah, don't make that question up. When I was in the seventh grade, they were giving us all these information about how these Doppler effect would enable them to determine how far away something was and all that. And I say that it's kind of like when you close and open your eyes, it looks like the whole thing's jumping back and forth. And Doppler radar does that too, you know. I mean, it, like, it takes two different pictures real fast and it can tell how fast you're going. So I, got a, I was doing like you were doing. I got a question on a test about it. And they said, what is the Doppler system? And I gave them a big detail about how it worked. And they said they didn't want that. All they wanted was this is the way they measure. <laughs> you know, and I was thinking, she said, I didn't, she didn't want all the details. I gave her a cell amount of make a little bit of time. Um, 
So the term blank is a difficult concept to define since the requirements for it vary depending on the diagnostic test being run. The minimum requirement is the ignition switch off period must precede OBD2 drive cycle. That's a complicated question, isn't it? Trip. Trip. Wow. The term trip is hard to define. All right. Once the MIL is turned on due to a failure in the diagnostic or a diagnostic trouble code, if the system passes a test for that same diagnostic trouble code, how many consecutive times the, the MIL is turned off? Three. Three times. If it doesn't come back, see, they all they know that there's variability in the field so that things are going to come and go. The data for the conditions at the time the system first failed will be stored as what kind of data? Freeze frame. Freeze frame data. You guys better get used to that. It's really, really handy. You know, this one time these people picked up this Bronco, big Bronco, or it was an Explorer or something. It was an SUV. And they bought it, signed the papers, took the car, headed for Ozark on U.S. Highway 231, which is a pretty good little nice straight four-lane run. They came back about 45 minutes to an hour later, and they said the check engine light had come on, and they decided they didn't want the car anymore, and they wanted out of the deal. And they said, well, let us see what made the check engine light come on. And so I pull my um, code, and it's a P1270 code. And I went into the freeze frame data, and it said they were going 120 miles an hour whenever... They went so fast that it started shutting the fuel down and it threw a check engine light. So they slowed down. And they thought they had messed up the car because they felt it going home, 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 home. You know, they felt it. It was hitting the, they, the, the rev limiter, yeah. It wasn't over rev, it was over speed. Yeah. Why, do they, you not, why do they own a Bronco or Explorer? So why do they put that to keep you from going that fast? Because once you get that fast, you just touch the wheel and you'll just come oh, No, your, your, tires, your, your tires may come apart. Those tires aren't rated for that kind of speed. Now, if the tires they put on a Mustang or something like that, they're rated for 140, 150 miles an hour. But if you put tires on something like, uh, you know, plain old Bronco or something, or like a uh, Explorer or something like that, they are not rated for no 120, 100 plus mile an hour. Yeah, speeds. One time there was a guy that was working for him. You seen these revenue enforcement people? That they got a shirt that's this color and pants that are this color with stripes down the side. Yeah. And they say revenue enforcement on it. Oh no, I don't know about that one. Yeah, it says revenue enforcement. Oh, I'm not, I'm not, the pants and the shirt's the same color. Like state uh, Yeah, and he's got Crown Crown Victoria, and he he sauntered over to my service bay one day, and he goes, uh, he says my Crown Victoria, you know, state car. He said won't go but about 110 miles an hour. And uh, he said, so he says, what are we going to do? You know, can you help me with that? And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't typically try to get, I mean, on the Dothan police cars, I used to tinker with them and get them about another 40 miles an hour. But, you know, I'm a typical guy. I was going to say that. Anyway, he says, can you do anything with this? I said, well, let's go drive it and see what we feel. So uh, we was headed up 431. And I told him, I said, you're going to ride with me if I'm going to be driving 100 plus miles an hour. You know what I'm saying? And so he says, all right, I don't have a problem with that. So he gets over there, and he's sitting over here with his state trooper patch on his shirt and all that, and we're headed off up to 431. And when I was headed up this hill, and I was running about 110, he said, now be careful, trooper. <laughs> You're like, whoa, what? I thought you were a trooper. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, I'm going to get busted for driving his car that fast, and I'm trying to help him out. But anyway, it was he went, they didn't give him a police interceptor. Oh. He was issued a plain old gray crown Victoria that was just a plain old civilian car. But it had a state license plate on it. All, all, a, all, a, all a police interceptor is is it has a chip in it that takes the red limiter off. No, it's actually got different cooling and everything on it. Police cars have got to sit there with the beacons rotating in the hot summer. Well, yeah. they got an all cooler and all kinds of crap that other cars don't well, have. They've also got different tires. they got different suspension. they got more horsepower. There's a bunch of stuff that's different about police cars. Yeah, yeah. no. Well, they've actually got it like, instead of having uh, the ones when they first started putting the Crown Vickies together, the police, I mean, on those... The specs on it said that the police cruiser had 210 horsepower, and I think the other one had 100 and, 190, no, 100 and one bit much. Not, not much more horsepower, uh, but it was a, a but it got extra cooling. It got all kinds of stuff that's different about it. The transmission's different. I mean, there's a lot of stuff different about a police interceptor. The speedometer's different. It's got a certified calibration, so it's not just this. You know what I mean? It's not a factory car. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's got positive track in it. You take that police car we got right out there that came from OP and raise it up, it's positive track. 
And a regular Crown Vic's not like that. The one Amanda was driving, I guarantee you, you could turn the wheels in two different directions on it. You can take uh, one of the police interceptors and uh, stick your Eden M90 on it off of like a, off of like one of uh, what's the Eden M off of? It's some little supercharged car. It's a little like a Pontiac. Mm -hmm. Take a supercharger off of that, and uh, it'll bolt right up to the mouth hole. Be gone. Be gone. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, OBD-1 used a service engine soon light, or a check engine light, and other names for the same light. OBD-2 uses the term what? Yeah, but what does it look like? Check engine? No, what does it look like? Yeah, did you know what that, what that is? Uh, that is an international standards organization symbol. Have you ever sit down in a car nowadays and looking at the air conditioner, you see the little arrows pointing at the driver's face and his feet? That's ISO symbols. No matter what language you speak, you can tell what to do with the AC. The lights in there that's got the thermometer with its bottom dipped into the water, instead of saying hot or temp or whatever, they've got little symbols so that anybody that sits down in there doesn't have to speak English, they can look at these lights and know what they are. It's called a red and green sometimes. Yeah, and sometimes you'll have one that looks like a little, if you, the low coolant light looks like a little radiator. But a lot of these ISO symbols are like that, and the check engine light is one of them that looks like a little engine. As soon as somebody sees it, they know. You know. Yeah. 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 And some, and what people also do when the check engine light comes on, they, they call me and they say, hey, my check engine light come on, and I made sure it had plenty of oil and water and everything, but I don't see anything wrong. And <laughs> Well, what's wrong with that picture? It's actually an emissions thing, and it can be any about 100 different problems causing that. Um, most of the people are, are a little, I mean, a lot of people are getting pretty sharp about the check engine light, but a lot of people are still confused about it. Many of the J standards published and established in OBD2 were uh, organized by the what? Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, society uh, of... <coughs> Society of Automotive Engineers. Is that, is that right? Or is that Society of American Engineers? I know, I know what the book says. Automotive Engineers. Yeah. SAE typically deals with automotive stuff. Evaporative monitoring that requires a system to be pressurized or put under vacuum le to detect leak is called a what? Enhanced. It's enhanced. The other one, the, the non-enhanced system just wants to know if the purge is purging when it says it's purging. The other one does not. I mean, the other one actually is going to check to see if, there's any, if it's got integrity in the tank. Are you? Are you everybody? Is everybody happy with what you heard today? Society Automotive Engineers. Society of Automotive Engineers.